here we are with Brian Wilson, a Vietnam veteran, a one-time criminal lawyer uh, who's written extensively about U.S. imperialism and its effects around the world. And what people are especially interested in right now, Brian, uh, in, in here in Nicaragua is what's happening in the United States as a result of the murder on May the 25th of George Floyd. What's your take on that? Well, I think uh, that 8 minute 46 second video focused on that policeman with his knee on George Floyd's neck and his hand in his pocket as he's looking at the camera. I think that picture uh, finally disclosed viscerally 400 years of white exceptionalism in a way that people could feel viscerally uh, that this is what people have been going through through our entire history in the United States and before it even became a United States. Um, it exposed the fake identity of white supremacy uh, in a way that nothing else has been able to do like that video. And it changed the whole culture in a way. It affected everybody, not just in the United States, but in the world. These demonstrations against police violence are happening all over the world, not just in the United States. Um, now, I am a, a white male who, because of that, have been privileged. And I discovered in Vietnam that that privilege had become a disability because it had made me, in a way, stupid. It had made me so comfortable, in a sense, that I wasn't, I didn't need to ask serious, penetrating, critical questions about the war or about my history. Uh, but there became a time in, in Vietnam where I realized that I am living with a fake identity, which was interfering with my capacity to see clearly, to think clearly, and to operate in a, in a way that represented uh, me as a human being, the way I would think that I would want to be as a human being. So what happened on May 25th, I think, uh, was, a, was like a lightning bolt that struck the hearts and minds of virtually everybody in the United States and around the world, including the white supremacists, who now know that their fake identity has been exposed. And that makes them more violent. Because I know from my experience, when I lost my, when I realized my fake identity in Vietnam, I was suicidal. I took my own pistol and put it to my head. Because I've been living a lie. And uh, how, how is that, how is that possible? that everything I had been taught in school and church and home and community was not true. That's, a, that's an astounding uh, revelation to deal with. And it has huge emotional repercussions of being worthless. Shame. Shame is what I realized was something that my society had never experienced after genocides against the indigenous and the blacks. If you don't experience shame, you can't grow. Your, your development is, is, is a stopped because you don't find your empathy. Empathy is critical to being a human being, to being a collective, in, in a collective society. So from that experience, I felt that what happened in May, and it's still happening, it's uh, in, in Portland, for example, where I lived for 12 years and still have a home. Uh, they are in their, I think they're in their uh, 86th day of protesting police violence every day. And many other cities, the same, it's just not as, been as, not as intense as in Portland. Um, 
I think there's several cops in Seattle that have quit saying, we just can't do can't do this every night. We can't be putting up with this 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 protest against police brutality. That these young people, the young people who are leading the protests in Portland and elsewhere, know that they have no future in the United States. They know that protest, the First Amendment means nothing. Uh, if if you're going to say something that's really poignant about society, it's not protected. If you're going to talk about police brutality, it's not protected. But police brutality has been the norm for the whole society in our whole, whole history because policemen have been designed and intended to protect private property. Could you talk a bit about the historical development of policing in the United States and how that led to what happened in, on May the 25th? Well, uh, police have... The concept of police, even before the word policing, when they had guards or Pinkertons or... Uh, they, they were hired to preserve the property of the, of the property owners. And, of course, originally the property owners owned human beings called slaves. And so the, the original uh, systemic version of police was to police human beings, meaning if you run away, we're going to come and get you. We will kill you if we need to, but we'll certainly bring you back to your slave master. Uh, after the Civil War, uh, we had a, basically wage slavery replaced chattel slavery. And so we had the rapid development of factories and the robber barons. They all had private, originally, police to maintain order in the factories. And if there was any labor union activity, of course, that was immediately repressed. In the history of the United States, there's been almost 800 labor organizers that have been murdered, uh, more than in any other country, really. Uh, so, um, uh, all through the, from the 1860s to into the 1930s, uh, the police were primarily protecting coal mines, the, the, the gold mines, the, the factories. And then we had people in cities that said, well, maybe we need to protect our neighborhoods. And so they actually hired policemen with uniforms on the, on the public payroll. And then the policemen formed unions. And the union heads of all the police departments in the United States are paid from the public police budget. So in a sense, police accountability is pretty much uh, neutralized by virtue of police unions, which are funded by the public uh, because the, the union head is paid out of the, out of the police budget. So starting uh, in the late 60s, uh, the development of SWAT teams. These were super, super groups of cops, heavily armed, masked, uh, body shields, and they were dealing with the black uprisings in the cities, and especially the Black Panthers. And would you say that, that the 60s was the moment when the U.S. police began to be seriously militarized? Seriously, militarized. Yes, and then subsequent to that, the United States Congress has passed several bills that authorize the military, the Defense Department, the Offense Department, to give to local police departments all over the United States free armored personnel carriers, jeeps, even tanks. So now we have a totally militarized police, even in small cities like Chattanooga, Tennessee, all police departments are militarized. Uh, in fact, increasingly now, when the, when the police show up, when there's a demonstration, the police themselves are the provocateurs 
of the of the uprisings because they they are like Martians. I mean, they're they're so decked out in black and can't see their faces. You can't see their shields. I mean, you can't see their uh, IDs. And in Portland, now in 85 or 90 straight days, uh, the police no longer wear their name tags. They use uh, various kinds of projectiles every day, every night, uh, concussion grenades, uh, tear gas, uh, rubber bullets, which really are metal with rubber covered, covering the metal. Um, there's been um, several dozen people seriously injured by the police. Have any police been killed in Poland? No police have been killed so far. Um, there has been, um, well, you know, the federal thugs were there for, uh, Trump's federal thugs came to Portland in early July, and they lasted about three weeks, and then they, they realized, well, this can go on forever, and people were saying those thugs were so brutal, they were creating the violence. Well, they left, and the Portland police are worse. They're, they're, they literally are worse. You're a member of Veterans for Peace, and one of your colleagues in that Veterans for Peace movement, Mike Hasty, was uh, badly attacked by the Portland police, was he not? Yeah, he's been attacked twice. Uh, he was a medic in Vietnam. Uh, he's been in the peace movement for at least 20 years. And he's a photojournalist, so he always has two cameras with him, with two different lenses. And he's, he's quick to go from one camera to the next, depending on what kind of a shot he got, uh, he wants. And he has taken incredible shots of uh, every night of what's happening. Uh, the, the first time he was uh, attacked, he was uh, telling this, this were the federal thugs before they left, he was talking to them up close, about eight of them. You can't see their faces. You can't see their name tags because they don't have a name tag on or it's covered. He was telling them that this was like Vietnam. And in Vietnam, he said, we committed atrocities every day. Every day we were committing atrocities in Vietnam. And you are doing the same with the people of Portland. And then, out of the blue, or out of the uh, out of the, out of the left side of his body, one of those thugs, about twelve inches from his face, just hit him head on with a tear gas and uh, knocked his glasses off. And he kept he kept talking. He kept atrocities. This is what we're all about. Atrocities, atrocities, atrocities. Do you understand? You don't know. This is what it's all about. And, uh, and then they left. And then he, then the, the medics, the the, the, the the medics of the peace movement was then helping him wash out his eyes. He, he couldn't see for about a day and a half. Um... Uh, and then, uh, about a week or two after that, he was getting close-ups of the Portland police. Uh, they love to use their batons. After they've used the tear gas, after the con concussion grenades, when people are coughing and, and choking and bending over, they come and club you over and over and over again. And he was filming them doing that. And then the police just... Uh, in mass ru rushed against him and several other people who were also taking pictures and uh, they knocked him on the ground and, and, and several cops smashed his face with their, with their foot just as he's on the ground he's, he's holding his cameras trying to protect his cameras and uh, he didn't get a fractured skull but he got a uh, very severe right eye injury, um, and 
other other people, by the way, have had fractured skulls from the rubber bullets going into the into the skulls. Uh, a rubber bullet is still a metal bullet with rubber on the outside, and they can penetrate the brain and paralyze you. And you cannot take. They're not operable usually. I saw this in the West Bank in the Gaza when I was there. I saw all the rubber bullets in people's brains. I went to the hospital to get the X-rays. Uh, so. These demonstrations are happening all over the United States. Portland just happens to be the flashpoint. And the young people, well, there's moms that are out there together in, in yellow shirts. There's vets that are out there with a different color shirt. And then there's uh, people that have the, the leaf blowers. They push the tear gas back to the police. So they have a lot of leaf blowers now. And the young people that are on the front lines, they look like gladiators. They have chest protectors. They have uh, shin guards. They have kidney protectors around their midsection. They have helmets. They have gas masks. Uh, they're there to take the blows every night. And uh, these people know that there's Five or 50 million people unemployed in the United States right now. There's 40 million people about to be evicted. There's no future for these young people. Half the small businesses will never come back to business. The United States government is doing nothing to help them. And meanwhile, the 10 most richest people in the world, billionaires, the 10 most rich billionaires together now own more than $1.1 trillion. Meanwhile, more and more people are homeless, more and more people are out of work, and these young people know this is our last stand. There's nothing more for us. The government is rigged. The, uh, the, the, the politics are fixed. They're not broken. They're fixed. Fixed in favor of the rich. And we know it. We now know it. And the, and the, and the uh, May 25th video of the cop's knee on George Floyd's neck really unleashed a kind of a visceral energy that can't be stopped. It's not possible to stop it because it, it's so it's so clear emotionally as well as intellectually that the society has always been this way for anybody but the white middle class, and the white middle class has only been prevalent since World War II for about 25 years. So they know it's done. People know it's, the United States is done, basically. There's no more normality. Brian, um, you were here in Nicaragua during the uh, failed coup attempt in 2018. And so um, you you were very familiar with what was going on here during that time. And is it is it possible? Is it fair to ask you to offer some kind of comparison between or contrast, perhaps, between what was happening here in Nicaragua during April to July two thousand and eighteen, and what you? Uh, I've been witnessing and learning about from your friends in Portland. Well, uh, I was getting ready to go into the hospital on, on April 18th. I was still at home waiting for my opera operation date. Um, when the news came out on the 18th that the police had massacred the students, that news came on the 18th. It wasn't true, but it, but it it was announced on the news on Channel 40, on 63 and Channel 10, Channel 12. And uh, I said to Olda, my compañera, I said, there's no way that the Nicaraguan police massacred students uh, unless the police were being shot at. It just, it just wouldn't happen. There would be no motive for the Nicaraguan police to shoot students. And then uh, by the 20th and the 22nd and 23rd, there were multiple shootings in eight different cities of, of uh, Nicaragua. And I, I said, this has been a 
this has been concocted with lies and things have yes people have died but the description and the narrative around what's happening is not what's really happening and uh and the and the brutality of the uh, opposition in nicaragua was uh, grotesque they they filmed they were filming themselves and putting it on uh, facebook and and uh, i don't use i don't use these others uh, like um, Instagram. Yeah, Instagram and so forth, and Twitter. I only use Facebook, which is bad enough. Uh, and so they were showing, I guess, to scare the Nicaraguan people that this is what's going to happen to you if you if you don't join us. Uh, I thought, and I told all of this is this kind of this kind of thinking that these opposition people have. They're brainwashed by the people in the United States. Because this is the kind of stuff that the National Endowment for Democracy and the CIA and USAID, they would think of things like this. Because they only know how to destroy and be deceitful. And uh, in Portland, uh, the police keep saying that the uh, what the people are saying about the police behavior, police brutality, isn't true. And that's all on camera. Uh, and the police are grotesque. Uh, and so anybody in Nicaragua that still listens to a, to their orders from the U.S., you, you know it's, 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 it has an agenda of destroying, not of building. And um, I'm afraid that there's, that money does speak. And when uh, uh, you bribe people, and by the way, I, I failed to mention, there are provocateurs in Portland paid by the police to cause, uh, to commit crimes, actually, that justified the police coming down even harder. Some of the police have been caught uh, uh, looting and arsoning and smashing windows. Sounds very similar to Chile. Yeah. What happened in Poland with the behavior yeah. of the police. Then. That's right. So. Uh, something has happened in the United States that can't be reversed. It's not just it's not just the virus that that for which the United States is the worst case in responding to the virus in the world. Partly because of white exceptionalism makes people in the United States think they're invincible. This is a a, a disease a disease that is permeates the culture. So they weren't prepared for the, the 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 virus, and as the president said, it's going to just go away. It's not going to be a big problem. So you add the virus, the police brutality, and Trump, in a way, <coughs> gifting the nation with a real truth about the American culture, the U.S. American culture. Without any cosmetic cover, the disguise is gone, the virus is, is ruining the economy, the police brutality is so obvious, and young people know that there's no future, and now we have Democratic and Republican conventions going through the theater of the absurd, uh, trying to distract people from the fact that we still spend $1.25 trillion a year on military all over the world, and not at home. I mean, it's so insane. One of the things about <laughs> the grassroots movement in Portland, Brian, is that they're very conscious of, 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 of the reality, the, the broader reality of United States politics and, and culture. And they, they, they want to change it. And one of the things that what they've been talking a lot about is how to develop uh, more community-based policing and how to replace the current police culture. There's this movement to defund the police, I think they, 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 they call it. And, and do you think Nicaragua has anything to offer the, the people in Portland by way of you know, possible examples that they might try and set up and follow? Well, I think uh, community policing requires a trust 
in the population with the government, uh, a basic trust. Uh, in the United States, there's absolutely no trust in the government. There's no trust in the media. There's no trust in the healthcare system because it, there isn't there isn't really a healthcare system. It's a private system that has some public components, uh, but never a guarantee of, of health care. Uh, so the, the defund police and defund the military are both very appropriate slogans, uh, but they're not going to be achieved, in my opinion, through voting or through legislation. It's going to be because people stay in the streets indefinitely for months and months and months and months until there is some space for a dialogue about the destruction of capitalism for, for profit or an economic system designed for profit rather than for the needs of the people. I don't see any future in legislation, in other words, through the, through the, through the political system uh, or through voting political system, which is, itself is a rigged system of voting. But it means people have to be in the streets. And the question is whether people have the, the ideology of solidarity with other people around the world and enough tenacity and enough um, strategy and discipline to remain in the streets indefinitely throughout the country. And there's people in the streets, even in Chattanooga and Memphis, Tennessee. It's not just Portland. Portland happens to have a lot of activists that live in Portland. It's a white city. It's predominantly a white city, but their 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 motto is now "Black Lives Matter." So the young people know that all of our lives now are are impacted by the collapse of capitalism, which the virus has shown, which police brutality has shown, which President Trump has shown. Uh, I mean, President Trump really has revealed the true nature of our culture, of the United States culture. And do you think there's a chance that at a, at a state level or at, perhaps at a community level that there may be able, it, there may, it may be possible to build a movement for community policing? Because here in Nicaragua, community policing focuses on youth and they treat youth as, they, they don't see young criminals as delinquents, right. they see them as youth at risk. And do you think there's any chance that that culture might take root and develop, uh, albeit in a limited way, from in one place or another in the states? Um, it's possible, but really, what's happening is there has to be a whole change in the consciousness of the culture. Nothing's going to work now without a change, and that's why the explosion of empathy from the knee on the neck, that knee is on all of our necks now. That's kind of metaphorically, I think, how people experience it. Holy shit. We're all, we've all got that knee on us. And it's been on us all along, but we pretended that we were supreme as white people. And that's gone. So I think that it is very likely that new models will emerge of bioregionalism whereas sections of the country that have good fertile soil and uh, enough rain will create local economies without, without supply chains, without long supply chains. That would be what I would call an indigenous model uh, or an early Neolithic model, but it would be a local model. It would be de-dollarizing and de-globalizing into a more local uh, community where familiarity is the primary accountability mechanism, not law, but familiarity. I think that is logically uh, something that would, e it would evolve out of the, the calamity of capitalism, which is, which as far as I'm concerned now, is never going to recover, <clears throat> fortunately. It's a dis terribly <coughs> destructive system. <coughs> and you know, the Iroquois, uh, who were destroyed pretty much by uh, 
George Washington in the 1770s and 1780s during the Revolutionary War. And I have I happen to have been born in in, in the Iroquois country. <clears throat> um, the Iroquois chiefs in 1790 called George Washington, who was the first elected president, we call him, they called him the town destroyer because he destroyed every Iroquois village to ashes, one of which was my village. I was born in Geneva, New York. At that time, it was called Canada Saga. Uh, and I think the United States has always been the town destroyer. That's how we formed as a nation. We stole the land from the Indians. We stole the labor from the Africans. And we called ourselves exceptional. And we have played this, this um, game with ourselves for 400 years. And it's now crashed. And that's why I think that May 25th video is so important because it in one eight minute video, you see a picture of 400 years of persecution of whites, Indians, women, poor whites, blacks, by the whites that feel that they're superior. And you see how sick that is. It's really sick. So, my, I'm not particularly hopeful or non-hopeful or optimistic or pessimistic. I think the reality is the system is no longer going to be functioning. And the question is, is there going to be enough of a revolutionary movement to create space to create, reconstruct something different, such as a social democracy committed to the needs, producing for the needs of the people. And that might be in a bio, in a bio regional nature, especially as climate catastrophe becomes more intense. In other words, the, the areas where are going to be more habitable will be where there's where there's uh, still a temperature that's bearable and has enough moisture, and that's going to be more limited as as the next five ten years go by. But there will be places that are habitable, and those are the areas that might create recreate the model that we originally destroyed when Eurocentrics came to the new world and destroyed the indigenous lifestyle. Uh, but I, it's, it's, it's clear now to most people in the United States that something has happened that can't be reversed. And Brian, in a few days time, it's going to be the 33rd anniversary of the terrible attempt against your life that took place when you were protesting against armaments being sent to the war in Nicaragua. You suffered very, very severe injuries and people were amazed that you survived. I am too. Um, and so, but in all that time, you've continued to show solidarity uh, with victims of anti-imperialism around the world, but especially for Nicaragua. You never, you never, you've always maintained your strong attachment and affection and admiration for Nicaragua and its Sandinista San revolution. And could, could you talk to people about why you feel that? Well, my, my own personal revolution started in April of 1969 in Vietnam. That's when I had this uh, epiphany that, that really affected my whole, my whole being. Uh, it's where I discovered that I really have empathy, and uh, I didn't know much about it. I was, I had, I was getting prepared to go to law, law school. I got drafted out of law school. Had to do my time. I was just going to resume being a lawyer. So something happened in Vietnam that made me realize that all people are connected, and that I fell in love with the Vietnamese Revolution. I didn't even know it was a revolution until I had my epiphany. Oh, I'm dealing with a revolution and I am on the wrong side. I am an invader. So that kind of awakened me in general to the conditions in the world. And uh, in 1986, 
I had my first opportunity to come to the quote unquote third world outside of Vietnam when I got a scholarship to study in uh, Spanish in the Nika school in Esteli. Uh, so I came to Nicaragua in uh, 1986 and I spent two months in Esteli studying Spanish even though I didn't learn it very well. Uh, and uh, I was taken by the revolution that I had been reading about and then I was living with two families in not two months, watching them in their literacy campaign, studying every night, reading and writing on the chalkboard. Uh, both families with children diligently studying every, every extra moment. Uh, and knowing that the United States was trying to destroy the revolution, I just became... Uh, more uh, committed to not only supporting uh, a popular revolution that helps people people's lives, but to work against my own country's policies that destroy aspirations of people because they're not willing to to uh, kiss the Uncle Sam's ass in the way the Uncle Sam wants to to to, to, to live and economically survive uh, according to U.S. rules. And I had learned that from the Vietnamese. Uh, so I also had been in El Salvador, been with the guerrillas. The same, same kind of a struggle against centuries of oppression. And uh, I knew how much money U.S. was giving to El Salvador every day. I knew how much money U.S. was giving to it to the cultures every day, because I, I mean, I was in the news, I was following, I had actually many file folders of notes and articles, uh, and I was following what was happening in Guatemala, uh, and then in, uh, in 1994, I, uh, I went to Chiapas after the uh, uprising in, in Chiapas, after NAFTA went into effect. Uh, and I'd already been to the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, and I had been to Iraq after the bombings. I had um, I had been in Haiti uh, before Haiti before Aristide was overthrown the first time. Uh, in fact, I arrived in Baghdad after I'd been in Haiti to read the headline in the one English-speaking paper in Baghdad. It's called the Baghdad Observer. Aristide overthrown in coup. And I thought, you know, I can't go any place. And I'm reminded of the United States is just messing with everybody. And it, you know, it's, and so in some way, my motivation is, uh, I, I can't stand the suffering. It's, uh, it's my suffering. And I still hear in the, in the villages in Vietnam, after we left the villages after bombing them, I still hear the moaning, the people that weren't yet dead. Some nights I wake up crying hearing that moaning. And we, we just left them to die without any medical care at all. It's like, what kind of a human being is involved in this kind of behavior? You know, and so I, you know, it really required me to look at myself and realized that my white identity was a disability because I had internalized it like most of us have. It was our life. It was, we were lucky, we were white, white males. We didn't even have to work hard to get anything. And it meant that I couldn't critically think or see what's really happening. And that's what happened to me. That's why I put the pistol in my head in Vietnam. I was like, oh my God, I'm a fake. I'm like an ideological robot. And so Nicaragua was a real live revolution when I came here and it, and my country was trying to destroy it. And am, am I gonna be, am I gonna be uh, uh, support the destruction of a revolution or am I gonna support the revolution? I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of a no brainer. Once you, once you have had that awakening, um, I didn't, I didn't expect to live this long, but 
Here I am talking about it. And your your support has been very important, especially over the last two three years, through what has been a very difficult time for Nicaragua. With so much, with so much, so many falsehoods uh, spread about. So many falsehoods spread about what's been happening in Nicaragua, and yet you 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 have you been. Do you think that that epiphany that you had that? Many years April ago. 1969. Do you think that April 1969 April epiphany 4th. has made it possible to, for you to see through all the falsehoods? Oh, yeah. Put about? Uh, all I see is falsehoods. Then I studied history. And the United States is built on falsehoods. It's a whole fake history we learn. So everything that we learn in the West, and certainly in the United States, is not true. And so we have to keep telling lies to keep concealing the original lie to, me, to know, in order to feel okay. So no, I knew. I knew it was all bullshit. And, do you think and, I, and I haven't taken LSD and I haven't taken a lot of drugs. I was, it was a raw, a raw experience that I was right in the midst of and like my brother said, that I put in my obituary, after my parents died, who were very right-wing, one of our good friends said to my brother and I, how did you two boys come out of those two parents? And my brother, right away, I didn't have anything to say particularly, my brother right away said, we discovered we had a brain. <laughs> oh, okay, maybe that's true. But we also discovered we had a heart. Uh, and my brother later told me the reason that he was so anti-racist uh, is that when, in third grade, there was one black girl in his class. This was in Geneva, New York. And the teacher, who was our next door neighbor, Mrs. Witter, called the black girl up to the class to do something on the blackboard, and she didn't get it right, and Mrs. Witter hit her with a, with a, with a yardstick. And my brother never forgot that. He would talk about it. He would say, look, he said, from that moment on, I knew something was really wrong with how we're trained, how we're educated. And so he was, he was nine and a half years older than me. So he kind of, he kind of led the way for me to have a, a break from our parents who were very strict, <coughs> very strict. Republican reactionaries, really racist. Uh, so my brother, who died this last Sunday, but his time was due. But knowing that he's not around, it's been very hard for me just to uh, realize mm, he's, no, he's, he's no longer somebody I can, can touch. I mean, this happens to everybody in the world, I know, uh, all the time. But... Um, I've had a lot of death in my, in, in my life, and I've never felt it like I have with my brother, my sibling. My 30, my 79 years, I've been his younger brother. So, Brian, would you say, do you think it's fair to say that your understanding of what you come to know and learn about uh, the way Nicaragua's revolution has really and truly focused on, they may not have got everything right, but their focus has been on improving the lives of their impoverished majority. And would you, would you say that knowing that and, and, and experiencing it, uh, in its different phases over the last 30, 40 years has, has been a source of moral strength to you in terms of confirming your feelings about your epiphany and about your feelings about your brother and, and what your brother thought was right. And do you think, is there any correspondence between what you know and about Nicaragua and all, all that stuff that you've been talking about? Well, all through the 80s, 
at least when I was coming to Nicaragua after 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, every time I had a chance to speak here and in the United States, I said, the Nicaraguan Revolution is as important for the people of the United States as it is for Nicaragua because we need a revolution. We, the United States. We may, we may see, we've never had a real revolution. We haven't had the first one yet. We may have it now, or we may just go extinct. But yes, experiencing a real revolution with all of its mistakes, but an effort, an earnest effort to bring health care and education and, and literacy uh, to campesinos. I mean, what's more revolutionary than that? Just bringing, uh, bringing some very tangible kinds of help and support to people who otherwise would just be forgotten. Like the indigenous in the United States who are totally forgotten. I mean, they're worse than the blacks in terms of the, their conditions. 80% unemployment, 70% alcoholism. I mean, and that was their land. Uh, it's like, it's like we are, we are, we are so contaminated with our um, violence and our lies that I, that it, it really does require a revolution to break through, just like the Sandinista revolution break through the Samosa, uh, the Samosa mentality, and the Samosa policies. There has to be a break in in the way of people's thought process. And for me, that ha did happen in Vietnam. And it happened to a lot of vets, but not a majority of them, but some. And I think the May 25th video was the beginning, along with the virus, along with Trump, is the, is the, it's, it's over. The, ha the, the honeymoon is over. The white exceptionalism, phony identity is done. It may lead to a civil war because the white males are armed to the teeth and they want to defend their fake identity because I know in Vietnam when I realized I had a fake identity, I was thinking about committing suicide. I mean, losing your identity as a 27-year-old or as a 30-year-old or a 16-year-old or a 50-year-old, that's a tough thing to go through. I mean, everything I've been taught is, a, is, a, is bullshit. What? You mean my priest is my priest is telling lies? My teacher is telling lies? My parents are telling me lies? My school books are telling me lies? How can that be? And yet, the whole history of, that we learn about the United States is fake. That's the book I'm writing now. The fake history of the United States, and it and it and it screws us up completely. We can't see clearly. We can't relate to people uh, in any just way because it's our way or, or no way, and that it's it's blinded us. And so, I'm I'm glad I'm 79. Uh, I have no idea what's going to happen except there's no. I know there's not going to be any revert, any return to normality, and that is good. Because normality in the United States was horrible. Thank you.